Certainly one of the more intriguing programs in college football is in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. We're talking uh, UNC and Mac Brown with Ross Martin from Inside Carolina 247 Sports. Please uh, smash the like button once you enjoy the conversation, which I sure you will. And uh, of course, uh, subscribe here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Ross, how you doing today? I'm great, Mark. I appreciate you having me on and excited to talk some UNC football. Yeah. I said this at the beginning of the season, this program, this particular team going into 2020 was the most intriguing for me coming off, obviously the two bad Larry Fedora seasons Then Mac gets him to seven and six playing down to the wire games week after week after week. And then with all that offensive firepower, what they would pull off in 2020. So I would think that uh, Tar Heel Nation was pretty satisfied with what happened in 2020. Yeah, I mean, actually, I, I kind of want to say it was a little bit of a disappointment because they had two bad losses. And if they had beaten Virginia, which I think they should have, and Florida State, which I think they definitely should have, uh, Florida State ended up being really, really bad. I think UNC caught them when they were playing unbelievable. Um, they had a really good game against the Tar Heels. But, I mean, UNC should have been uh, just one loss in the regular season uh, to Notre Dame. I think Notre Dame was obviously the better team than Tar Heels, and they could have you know, be sitting here at what, what, uh, 10 and two or yeah, 10 and two with, with, with the losses to Notre Dame and Texas a and the Orange Bowl, something like that. So I think things are definitely trending up and, and that's how Mac Brown's kind of selling the program. But if you look at the season and they should have won two more games and the optimism would be even higher, uh, heading into the Orange Bowl and then heading into the 2021 season where, I mean, the sky's the limit now with Sam Howell returning, a lot of defensive players returning and just the momentum of the, of the program shooting up when you include recruiting in that as, as well. Yeah, I probably should have reframed that because, yeah, those two losses to Florida State and Virginia, especially the FSU loss, were head scratchers. But in just in regards to a good feel about where this program's headed, and even in an Orange Bowl loss, considering you lose your best defensive player, all your explosive players on offense, and you still hang within a touchdown until like a minute left against Texas A&M, one of the top five teams in the country. That was actually a good look compared to what we saw out of Florida and some other teams across the country. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty impressive what they did to kind of stay with them, especially on defense, um, and then to kind of figure out a game plan on offense using kind of the wide receivers and Sam Howe and not leaning as much on the run game and kind of the fight. And that comes back to the coach, and the coaches just kind of had them prepared, had them motivated, and kudos to them and kudos to the players for kind of following through on that. That's, it was kind of it's, it's kind of unreal how the optimism is so high after a loss. They're spinning this loss as a as a kickstart to the 2021 season, which is hard to do. But Mac Brown's a great politician, a great salesman. He's able to kind of spin it around to where um, a, a loss and a really a two touchdown loss to Texas A&M that was was closer than the the scoreboard read. It was really a positive because of how UNC looked for most of, of the first three quarters, how they fought with the SEC program, how they had the lead, and really a chance to kind of take the lead entering the fourth before um, I think Texas A&M just kind of overwhelmed them, and you saw the lack of depth that UNC had at certain positions. But it was a good game on a national stage. I think a lot of people came out very impressed with what UNC had this year and what they will have next year with pretty much the same roster they rolled out in the Orange Bowl, especially with Taman Fox returning, which was announced yesterday, who is their uh, sack leader on the defensive line there for the Tar Heels. And really the highlight of the season for me, just not just in regards to opponent, but for them to go down to Miami in a game where they're a field goal underdog. And if you would have told me that they're going to score 62 points, I might have believed that, but I would have thought Sam Howell's got to throw for six touchdowns, 500 yards. But for them to just physically annihilate Miami up front, offensive line, those two backs just come and battering that defense. That was overwhelming. Yeah, it was super impressive. And those running backs have been solid all year, and that was kind of a, a chance for them to show the nation what they've done. And kudos to the offensive line for, for playing really well in that game. Uh, UNT loses Javante Williams and Michael Carter, but it was impressive how they just dominated – uh, Miami, who we would think has better talent, at least in terms of recruiting, kind of initially um, down in South Florida, um, that that UNC could play toe toe with them and really dominate them and win win by you know over thirty points at uh, and, you know at South Beach. So that was awesome to see for the Tar Heels to get that huge victory. They kind of announced them and kind of kickstarted the season there, and, and that got really the hype was really cooking after that. 
But you're right. That run game was incredible. I don't think we're going to see that next year. They lose uh, Carter and Williams. So you're looking at the situation now. They have to find some some backs that definitely aren't as talented, aren't as developed to kind of plug in those holes. I do think the run game takes a step back next year. But I hope fans enjoyed what Javante Williams and Michael Carter did because they were incredible. And that, those are once in a 10-year type talent, I think, for, for a program like UNC to have both those at once. They split carries. I mean, you know, other teams have these bell, care, uh, bell cow backs. UNC had two elite backs split carries. And uh, they were super impressive this year. And it was it was definitely fun to watch and fun to cover. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, breaking down the game we all love each and every day. Best bloggers, broadcasters, writers in the nation. Uh, so lock it on in and check out North Carolina uh, coverage with Ross Martin from Inside Carolina on 247 Sports. You know the brand. You know it's top notch. So you've pretty much set us up with the two backs leaving. Deami Brown, he's got to be gone as well. Chas Surratt on defense, Tamon Fox, uh, anybody else that has yet to announce or is in Fox, that mix? Fox announced he's coming back. Oh, that he's coming the, back. He's yeah, coming back. Yeah, okay. that was the news yesterday. Um, so he is back for that extra COVID year. And he, he is a senior that's taking advantage of the extra year there. Daz Newsom is entering the draft. He was a senior. Um, he has a chance to be drafted as well. Um, so, I mean, if you draft wise, I mean, Michael Carter, Javante Williams, uh, Chad Surratt, those guys are likely to be drafted. I think Dami Brown is going to be also drafted, probably more of a, a second day, third day type guy. Definitely second day, third day type guy. Um, but those are the key players they lose. So if there's three offensive skill players and then the, the, the best inside linebacker they have and really a guy that can rush the passer. So they're losing four really good players. Um, but I think you're getting a lot better on defense. Uh, interesting to see where Michael Carter and Javante Williams go in the draft. I think they both have uh, have a chance to be have at least you know be on a team and, and have a, a special career in the NFL. Now the transfer portal is blowing up for everyone. I see a pretty long list with North Carolina. Uh, the name that comes to mind was I remember the recruitment of Jace Reuter. He was a former four star who's moving on. Uh, Rontavius Groves. Uh, didn't catch a ton of passes, but he had that big one against Miami on fourth down mm -hmm. that led to a big win uh, at the beginning of Mac Brown's run there in 2019. Caught 41 passes, a couple touchdowns in his stay. Anything impactful, whether we're talking arrivals or departures in the transfer portal? Well, I think the guys that are leaving, like you mentioned, and, and there was another guy announced today, Patrice Rene. Um, these guys are leaving because they're they're not getting enough snaps. They're not going to be playing a lot next year, so they're leaving for a reason to see if they can land somewhere else and get some more time. So I don't think UNC is losing anyone of note. Rene, he's a senior. He could have stayed and been a backup. He's hoping to go somewhere, I imagine, and. Um, and start maybe and it boost his NFL draft stock. But UNC has three good corners behind him, or I guess in front of him now is Storm Duck, colleague Michael, and Tony Grimes. He got bypassed by Grimes um, midway through the season. The, the losses will not – on the transfer portal, the losses will not impact UNC. I think they have guys who are stepping in. They, they're they looking around for players to add. There's no names that have emerged to our knowledge. Um, I think they, they might be looking at a, at a running back. If someone fits the bill, they do have two running backs coming in the 2020 class. Um, they've showed some interest in a, I think Jordan Williams is a Clemson defensive tackle. Some interest there, but I don't know if that's as serious. And I don't know if you would want to come and, and kind of be a rotational player. So, you know, they can be picky in the um, in transfer portal. They want people who can fit the system. They want people who won't take a scholarship for, for many years and not be a contributor. They want players who can definitely be an impact and make them better. Because I think Mac Brown and the coordinators see next year and 2022 is kind of the years where they can really compete with Clemson for an ACC title, make the ACC, ACC championship game, win a lot of games and have a chance to you know, be there for another New Year's Six Bowl or, or maybe have an outside chance of college football playoff um, with Sam Howell you know, in his final year. So it will be interesting to see if they, if they get anybody in the transfer portal. Right now, we don't expect that to happen, but I, I want to close the door on that. I think they could definitely benefit from adding um, maybe a piece on defense and maybe a running back. Those are the only spots I think UNC really needs someone where someone from the outside can come in and be an impact player, but we'll see. Got Ross Martin on the line from Inside Carolina. Catch his work and the rest of the staff there at 247 Sports Inside Carolina. Uh, it's a third-rated class uh, in the ACC, number 14 in the nation, with uh, 18 commits, according to 247.
So uh, any additional targets as we head toward February? <laughs> They're going after a cornerback uh, who's uncommitted, and the name escapes me. I don't cover recruiting as closely. But they – I mean, just to talk about their – uh, 2020 class. They, they signed, like you said, 18 um, in December, which has kind of become the de facto National Signing Day. And they're loaded. I mean, this has been a, a great class for UNC. Uh, number 14 in the nation, number three in the ACC. Bunch of in-state guys, a bunch of four stars, one five star, just stocked with talent from in-state. They got their quarterback in Drake May. You may remember his last name. Luke May was his brother, who was a um, basketball player for UNC, and his dad played quarterback for UNC. Really got better on defense with Javari Ritzy, Keyshawn Silver, Power Eccles, uh, Renary Dilworth, all like fast athletic defenders on that front seven. So they stocked up on talent. And this is going to be one of the defining classes when you look at UNC, you know, two, three years from now, the 2020 class. Um, they got a lot better in a lot of places, I think, especially on defense, where Fedora, dude, Fedora had a great offense. Like you can't complain about some of the offenses on the Fedora, but the defense is where they really struggled. I think Mac is kind of changing that with with recruiting pretty equally on both sides of the ball and really uh, upping the talent on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, definitely. Those Elijah Hood, Ryan Switzer teams were fun to watch. Mm -hmm. 2015, that was a, a great team. Uh, they struggled without a quarterback in seven and 17 and 18 after Mitch Trubisky left. But when he had a quarterback and they had a good run game, pass game, I mean, you can't complain about 2015. That was an incredible year, 11 and three. Um, Went to a bowl down in Florida, but made the AC championship game and almost beat Clemson in that well, AC that championship that game. Showed up, or what I mean is, didn't show up against Baylor in that bowl That's game. That's right, Baylor. like six hundred yards rushing in that game. It was ugly. Yeah, yeah, that was Gene Gene Chizik's defense too. They were pretty good during the season, but uh, they did collapse in the bowl game. Got Ross Martin on the line. Uh, check him out on Two Four Seven Sports uh, Inside Carolina. Uh, one last thing here: What is it about Mac Brown? Uh, a lot of people thought when he took this job, ah, this guy's mm -hmm. been around a long time and he's been away from the game for like six years. This isn't going to work. He's too old. Go through the grind of recruiting and everything you got to do to build a program. And look what he's doing. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Um, you know, people on on rival. Uh, school grow message boards called him Grandpa Mac. He's not he's really not that old. I mean, he's 69, which is the same age as Saban, uh, younger than my dad, too. So the energy's there. Uh, I think recruiting, he's always been a great recruiter, and that hasn't changed. He's great with families, great with parents. He knows how to sell a program. I mean, he is on the radio and TV and ESPN nonstop during the season and offseason. So he's raising UNC's profile where football is becoming more important and just more visible. I think that helps because um, UNC has the brand. They have the Jordan brand. They have the Carolina blue. They have the kind of that recognition that basketball provides them. So it's not like UNC is some unknown brand and program. So that's kind of there. Um, they don't have much, much history, but you know, Matt can show that he's got done before. I think that helped the fact that they got to top 10 back in 1997, 96, 97, 98, that range when he, right before he left for Texas. Um, so he can, he's shown that he can do it, but he has done it before. So it's easy to kind of lay out the, the map there. He's great with high school uh, coaches and his, his recruiters have been really good building connections in state. That's helped the 2020 class. And then I think he's hired the right people. I mean, he's not there making play calls. He's not really game planning as much. Um, he's making suggestions. He's making tweaks and, and changes and kind of broad scheme stuff. But Phil Longo and Jay Bateman, they run the offense and defense. Um, and they're doing a great job. I, I think the defense has been a little bit behind the offense the last couple of years, but I think that will switch in 21 and 22. The defense will catch up. Jay Bateman's got a lot of talent coming in, uh, developing a lot of talent. So you got the right play callers. They're keeping, I think they're going to keep all their whole staff this year too, if, if nothing changes. And uh, Phil Longo has had one of the best offenses the last two years. And it, it should be just as good if that run game can get cooking in, in 21. So Energy there is recruiting there. They, they, he delegates. He's got the right play callers and the right staff in place. And uh, he's just well-liked and good with donors and good with families. And you put that all together, and it, it makes for an interesting combination. And you're kind of seeing that happen here entering year three, that it's paying off and that shows if you have the right leadership and you can communicate well and your players can trust you and, and you can make some good hires, special things can happen um, for football. So. Yeah. yeah, Clemson's owned the conference for five years. Yeah. Florida State and Miami, of course, they're the conventional picks to challenge because of the recruiting footprint in the history. But North Carolina is starting to break through, and it's 
it's a program to keep an eye on. There's no doubt about that. For sure. Trying to break yeah, through I, on I, this. Go ahead. Miami and Florida State down. With Florida State down, you know, Miami's not what it used to be. Virginia Tech's not what it used to be. It kind of leaves that opening for the Tar Heels to, to compete with Clemson. I think UNC is pretty far away from Clemson like everyone else, but there's no there's no reason why UNC shouldn't win the Coastal next year and, and be there for a couple of years at least to to be that team who can be up there with uh, with Clemson as long as Miami kind of is where it is. Um, but, of course, Miami could be there right with them. So I think UNC's main competition is, is the Hurricanes moving forward. Absolutely. Ross Martin, Inside Carolina, 247 Sports. Check him out there. Ross, we appreciate you stopping by, breaking down the heels for us. I appreciate it. Thanks for the time.